Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Sisters and brothers, we welcome you to holy worship on this second Sunday of Easter. And again, we gather to give praise and glory to God who has raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We are thankful to have a group here in the sanctuary, a very, very small group. We're thankful to have you present and sharing in this service with us. My name is David. Matthew Atho, our associate pastor, will be preaching God's word for us here today. One announcement I would draw to your attention. Please remember that every day, every weekday, Monday to Friday, you are receiving an email with a daily devotion written by Matthew. There also, at noon, is a streaming devotion. And we invite you to make full use of these tools for the nurturing of your souls and for the nurturing of the souls of your family. It is in the presence of the living God that we have gathered in order to worship. I invite you who are in the room, and if you would, for you who are in your living rooms, if you're able, would you stand? Let's share together in the call to worship. Rejoice, heavenly powers. Sing, choirs of angels. Exalt all creation around God's throne. Jesus Christ, our King, is risen. Sound the trumpet of salvation. Rejoice, O earth, in shining splendor, radiant in the brightness of your King. Christ, Christ has conquered. conquered. Glory, Glory fills you. you. Darkness, Darkness vanishes forever. forever. Rejoice, O holy church. The risen Savior shines upon you. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Our hymn is 304. Easter people, raise your voices. Easter people, raise your voices, sounds of heaven in earth should ring. Christ has brought us heaven's choices, heavenly music, let it ring. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Easter people, let us sing. Death can no more stop us from our pressing here below. For our Lord empowered us to triumph over every foe. Hallelujah, hallelujah, on to victory now. Easter with its resurrection song. When in trouble, move the faster to our God who rights the wrong. Hallelujah, hallelujah. See the power of heavenly thrones. May we join with one another in the opening prayer. Almighty God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, rose from the grave and conquered sin and death, grant that your people, walking by faith in the midst of life's storms, 
may recognize and choose you in the fury, that the storm may result in spiritual growth and maturity through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And you may be seated. Our first scripture comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Let's pray that God would speak to us as we open his word this morning. Lord, Lord, open open our our hearts hearts and minds by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we we may hear with joy what you say to us today. today. Amen. Amen. From verse 22. Immediately, he, being Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind... He became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. that you are with us today and I hope that you will come up close to your TV and join me up front just as we would do every Sunday when we are here in our sanctuary. This morning Miss Laura wants to start off by asking you a question. Have you ever tried something hard? Maybe something you were a little afraid to do at first? For my birthday one year when I was a little girl I got a brand new bicycle I was so excited and wanted to ride it so badly, but I was also a little nervous. I'd never been on a two-wheel bike, and I was afraid of falling off and getting hurt. Do you have a bike? Maybe you have a two-wheel bike. Maybe you were a little afraid when you rode it for the first time. Luckily for me, and I bet for many of you, my mom was there to help. As I was learning to ride the bike, she would walk along me as I began to pedal, holding on so that I wouldn't fall. And then, as I started to get the hang of it, she would let go of me just a little bit. When, I was, when she thought that I was really ready to take off, she would let go altogether. Now, the first few times that my mom let go, I got really nervous and started to fall. But my mom was always there to catch me. And with just a little bit of practice, I could ride that bike like a champ. And I bet many of you can too. This week's gospel story tells us about one of Jesus' most famous miracles. Jesus' disciples are on a boat on the sea, and they're starting to get nervous because the waves are getting higher and higher. And just as they're becoming nervous and starting to worry, they look out and see Jesus walking toward them on top of the water. They can hardly believe such an amazing thing. In fact, they think that maybe it's a ghost. 
Jesus can see that they are afraid, and he tells them, do not worry. Peter, one of the disciples, wants to know for sure. So he asks Jesus to help him walk on water too. Peter steps out of the boat, and can you guess what happens next? He begins to walk toward Jesus. But just like my very first tries on that new bicycle, Peter sees that he's really walking on water, and he begins to get nervous and he starts to sink. But just as my mom was there to help me, Jesus is there to help Peter. Now, we can't walk on water, can we? Not me, and I bet you can't. But we, but today's scripture lesson teaches us that when we are asked to do hard things in our lives, we are not alone. God is there with us. We may be nervous, anxious, worried, or scared, the different things that come up in life. But God holds each one of us in his care, and his hand is there for us whenever we need it. Isn't that a great thing to know? I sure think it is. Let's pray this morning. Can I see your praying hands? Heavenly Father, sometimes we go through hard times through storms in our life. We are thankful that you are there with us, supporting us as we face these difficult times. Thank you, Lord, that we can call on you at any time, that you will hear us, that you will calm us, and that you will help us through it all. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Our Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come. come. Thy Thy will will be done done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, my friends. Thank you, Laura. You know, as I heard the uh, scripture read in your account of it, it crossed my mind that what Peter did not say as he started to sink is, well, at least I can swim. (laughs) What he did say is he called out to Jesus, and Jesus reached out his hand and helped him. When we share in the Apostles' Creed, is that not what we're doing? We are calling out to the living God who has met us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The word of God has been read and proclaimed. Rightly do we respond as a people of faith. I invite you to stand. For you in your homes, I invite the same thing, if you will. And I would ask you, sisters and brothers, in what do you believe? I believe believe in in God, God, the the Father Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of of heaven and earth, earth, and in in Jesus Christ, Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And you may be seated. We are very grateful for the offerings that God's people are making. do want you to know that because of your generosity, we're able to send a sizable check to religious community services this week as they are responding to the need. 
and also because of your generosity, we were able to uh, serve as a staging place for Backpack Blessings to send out about 350 food boxes to families across four counties. So thank you very much for that generosity. Among our offerings is the offering of those who give us music at this time. An offering, uh, the song being offered is, He Will Hold Me Fast. But we worship God with the giving of offerings at this time.
And we share together in the choral prayer, Come, Spirit, Come. Come, Spirit, come, our hearts control, our spirits long to be made whole. Let inward love guide every need by this And are free. Father God, with the psalmist, we would declare, I love the Lord, for he has heard my cry and my supplication, and therefore. I will call upon him as long as I live. And we, your people, call upon you in this day. You are faithful and you are true. You are merciful. You are compassionate. You are loving and your grace abounds to us in all of the circumstances of life. And for who you are, we worship you for what you have done in Christ and in many, many other gestures, we give you honor and praise today. We offer ourselves to you that we would be yours. and We would love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, and that we would be strengthened with a grace in the inner being that we might have an endurance and a patience in this time of trial that bespeaks our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. Like Peter upon the water when he began to sink, may we cry out to you that you would be the God of all help to us, that you would be for us the rock that is higher than I, the very foundation of strength and hope. We pray for our sister in Christ, Sue Royster, and all who are part of her family upon the death of her husband, Bob. Comfort this family, we pray. We continue to give you thanks for the life of Carol Hamilton and offer her family to you. As her service was held this week, she is yours, and we believe that in Christ. Now comfort all who love her. Give healing and help and strength to those who are ill. And we remember our brother Jim Miller in this day and the many, many others who are listed on our prayer list. We pray for our governor and our president and all who have leadership in these days, that they would be wise. And we know that there are both pressures to remain closed and pressures to open, that there are Models that show things changing and models that show this extending. We are small and we see so very poorly. So we need you to guide those who lead. Give them a wisdom to make excellent decisions. We also ask you to protect our leaders from the vitriol and and the complaint of these days, may they be able to lay aside all statements that are unhelpful and hear that which is good and wise that gives wholesome direction. We pray for your church seeking to minister in these days, whether by streaming or by email or by mail, however your church is seeking to proclaim the gospel, May the gospel of our Savior Jesus be well proclaimed by the people of Christ in these days. And may we be reminded around the world, throughout the nations, that he is Lord of lords and King of kings and raised from the dead, 
and it is to him that we find refuge in a storm. Fill Matthew with your Holy Spirit. May he speak with power. May he speak with effectiveness. May he remind us afresh of how deeply we love Jesus and how fully we need him in this storm. And we ask this in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen. Our hymn of preparation, 512, Stand By Me. Hopefully the words are on your screen, and Matt's going to come and lead us. Stand by me. The storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, those who rule this land and water, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the host of hell assail and my strength begins to fail, thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. When I've done the best I can, and my friends misunderstand, Thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. In the midst of persecution, stand by me. In the midst of persecution, stand by me. When my balls in war array undertake to stop my way, thou who saved Paul and Silas, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When my life becomes a burden and I'm nearing chilly Jordan, oh, the lily of the valley, stand by me. Thank you, and those in the sanctuary can be seated. Our scripture reading this morning, our second reading comes from 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, beginning at verse 3, and we'll read through verses 9, uh, for, through verse 9, and invite you to hear uh, God's word as it is read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And this is the word of God this morning for the people of God. This morning we're looking at, uh, going to be focusing primarily on Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14 verses 22 and 33, and I want to talk to you for just a minute about storms, storms. 
uh, July 1st, 2012. I think it was David's first Sunday. I'm not sure. We've been here about three, uh, three months here in eastern North Carolina. And whenever, wherever you live, there are different types of storms that you have to get used to. Uh, we were in Kentucky uh, for uh, 12 years, and we had an ice storm that shut down the city for about a week. No electricity, no, I mean, it was just sheer uh, horrible ice. And uh, moving to eastern North Carolina, uh, July 1st, that afternoon, uh, Monica and uh, the boys were up in New York. They usually go uh, for the summer. We usually go as a family uh, for uh, a church camp. Uh, up there in northern New York, but it was Sunday afternoon, evening, late, and I was, uh, I guess I was uh, staying in, in our rental house we had rented from Myers and Stephanie Scott. It's located at 4713 uh, Trent River Drive. Uh, we were across the street from Sonny and Tay Roberts, and it was late afternoon, and I began to, I mean, the wind was coming, and you know, all the storm warnings are out. And I began to hear trees crack. I didn't know what they were at the time because I hadn't been in eastern North Carolina and hadn't lived through a, a windstorm or a hurricane. And I heard these, it was just like matchsticks, crack, 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 crack. And I wondered what in the world is going on? And I come to find out uh, that we were in the midst of a severe windstorm. Uh, I called Donnie Cox because I looked up July 1st, uh, 2012 on Google and uh, it popped up the storm, and it said the National Weather Service uh, said a violent and severe thunderstorm swept through eastern North Carolina during the afternoon and evening of Sunday, July 1st, 2012, killing three people, one in a collapsed building and two uh, due to a fallen tree. And I didn't even know that the name of the storm, I just thought it was a straight line storm, derecho is the name of the storm. And if that particular storm is named that, if the swath of the storm is 240 miles wide, and if there are gusts of 58 miles an hour or more, it is classified as a derecho storm. Now, it's different than a tornado. I won't go into all this detail, but just one more second before we move on. Uh, it's different than a tornado because a tornado has a rotation, but this is a straight shot wind uh, that can be very, very, very damaging. And for me, it was a very new experience living through a derecho storm. I thought Monday, the theme storms, Monday we had, I think there were between 30 and 40 storms uh, in our part of the nation on Monday uh, morning and afternoon, and I guess throughout the time of the weekend. Storms. Storms are a part of life. Uh, storms are referred to uh, throughout the scriptures, the first one of the first storms recorded in scripture is in Genesis chapter 6, where God sends a flood, and it is a storm of judgment to destroy the earth except for Noah and those in the ark, a storm of judgment. Jonah chapter 1, uh, God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh, and he hops on a boat to go to Tarshish in the opposite direction. A storm comes up, and Jonah's like, it's my fault. <laughs> this storm is my fault. And God had sent a storm of correction, of realignment uh, for Jonah. Jesus was in a storm in Matthew chapter 8, a few chapters before our storm for today. And it's kind of a hilarious account, really. It's not hilarious if you're in the boat, but it's hilarious because there's a humongous storm. This is a different storm than the one uh, that we're looking at this morning, uh, the windstorm. This is a storm that, that, in fact, threatened the disciples' lives. And Water was rushing into the boat, and it's kind of hilarious. I mean, Jesus is asleep in the back, <laughs> and the disciples have to wake him up. And they're like, you know, he rebukes the wind and the waves, and, and he's like, they're like, who in the world is this guy that even the winds and the waves obey him? There's another storm recorded in Acts chapter 27, and uh, you know, that, I, think that, I, I think we could classify uh, Matthew 8 as a test storm, a test storm. Uh, Acts chapter 27, uh, Paul is on a boat with 276 other people, and uh, he's sailing to Rome, and uh, a horrible storm comes up. I don't know, I'd, I'd encourage you to look at that passage of Scripture. I think that storm is, is really about listening to God in the midst of the storm. And all the experts were saying one thing, but Paul knew what God was saying, and God had specific directions. And in the middle of the storm, don't you hate it when people 
said, you should have listened to me. <laughs> In the middle of the storm, they're irritating, those type of people. And Paul's like, you should have listened to me. If you would have listened to me, you wouldn't have been in the midst of this storm. But you didn't listen to me. But nevertheless, God's assured me that no one is going to perish in this storm. Now, this particular storm, uh, and storms in general, have the potential to, uh, number one, sap our strength. Uh, Paul's in the middle of a 14-day storm. And the first three days, it says there was no sun and no stars. So it was a bad storm. And the longer the storm went, the more depleted of energy Paul and those on board were. And Paul encouraged the people on the boat after day 14 to eat something because they were very, very tired and their energy was very, very low. Storms also have the potential to block us from our goals. You'll notice in Acts chapter 27 that they threw, it's a cargo ship, a prisoner transport ship. And they had to throw all the cargo over the side of the ship. They, their goals for their trip were indeed blocked. And storms not only have the potential to sap our strength, but block us from our goals. But this morning we want to look at a specific storm that we find in Matthew chapter 14. And we want to look at several key words uh, in this particular passage of scripture that Matthew gives an account for that that number one, uh, you'll notice in verse 22, uh, right after, and you'll notice it's right after the feeding of the 5,000, right after a miracle, Jesus, it says immediately he made the disciples get into the boat. He made them, he compelled them, he forced them, he forced the issue. Now we get snapshots of this particular passage of scripture in Mark chapter 6 and John chapter 6 which give us just a little bit different lens to look at this particular story. And if all of us were in a boat, uh, 12 of us, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If seven of us were going in a, if we were in a boat this morning, those that are in our sanctuary went through a storm, we would process that storm totally differently. Some people would be focused on the wind speed, the wind direction, the, the chop, of the waves. Other people would be focused on the relationships that were occurring in the boat. Other people would be focused on something totally different. Is the boat here? I mean, is, you know, is the boat cracking up or whatever? So each of us would focus on something different and each of the gospel writers focuses on just a little bit different aspect of the boat experience that Matthew talks about in Matthew chapter 14. But I want to, I want us to look for just a moment at this, this compelling that Jesus, Jesus makes the disciples get into the boat. Now, we're, it, the, scripture, the scripture doesn't totally say what was going on in Jesus' mind. I, I think that you could, you could make an argument from scripture that part of why Jesus put the disciples in the boat was so that he, he, he could have some alone time because it said he went up on a mountain to pray. Certainly he had some depletion that occurred as a result of this miracle feeding of the 5,000 and there was a a need for solitude and time with his father to be replenished. But I think there might be something else that we could conjecture that uh, there, there is a, a teaching opportunity that, that presents itself in this particular passage of scripture. I, I don't think Jesus went up on the, the mountain to pray to conjure up this storm, but I think that there was an awareness that this storm was going to happen. Now, I, wanna, I want us to affirm this morning that in the midst of the storm, we, knew it, we need to affirm the fact that God put us in the storm to settle our soul, not to sink our ship. God put us in the storm to settle our soul, not to sink our ship. Now, I think you could make an argument from this particular passage of Scripture that Jesus is trying to teach the disciples that, that following him is not always great. Following him is not always filled with miracles. Following him can sometimes, in fact, be a struggle and be difficult and have tremendous opposition. If you'll read a couple of verses before, he's just fed the 5,000. And if you read the couple of verses after this particular story, Jesus is involved in miraculous healings. And people brought their sick to him and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment And as many as touched it were made well. So in the midst of these two uh, 
incredible miraculous events, there is a significant storm that takes place. And isn't that true about life? That even in the midst of God moving and doing incredible things, storms in life happen. And we need to be reminded this morning that God's hand is in the storm. I would suggest to you that this is, you know, we've, we've looked at different types of storms. There's storms of judgment. There's storms of redirection. There's storms that, that, uh, that are tests. There's storms that are, uh, that's very, very important that we listen to God, that Paul teaches us in Acts 27, that we listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and just not to the experts in our culture around us. But I think in this particular passage of Scripture, you could make an argument that that there is a test or a teaching aspect of this storm. Now, we're all aware that we're in the middle of a storm now. It's, it's, it's a storm sent by a, a health care crisis, a crisis uh, that's called uh, coronavirus. And I can't tell you how many people have asked me in the last few weeks, what is God trying to teach us in this storm? Now, that leads me to believe that, that quite possibly this might be a teaching storm. I read an article from Timothy Tennant at Asbury Seminary, and he talked about, you know, how our culture's really been in the pattern of the economy's going great, everything's going great, we've all got plans, the pride of presumption. And James tells us that, you know, if we make plans, we need to say up the Lord's will, and we need to be aware of God's plan and God's purposes and not just our plans and our purposes. That might be one possible teaching. I think there are many, many, many different things that God's trying to teach us in this storm. But we need to be reminded that God's hand is in this storm in Matthew chapter 14. The second thing that I would suggest to you this morning is that there is a challenge in the struggle of a storm, there's a challenge, but we are never outside God's vision and interest. There is a challenge in the struggle of a storm, but we are never outside God's vision and interest. I want you to look at the passage again in, in, in verse 24. It says, but the boat was by this time a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, and the wind was against them. In this particular Greek word, use, there, there's opposition, there's kind of a torture, there's, there's strong opposition. That the, the disciples were sailing in a direction where the wind was severely against them. Dallas Holm uh, was a popular Christian recording artist in the 1970s and 1980s. And on Easter Sunday, I can remember growing up in the church that one of his most popular songs was Rise Again. And for, you know, five or five, six years, something like that. That was kind of one of the songs that was sung on Easter Sunday. But he had another, uh, another song that he wrote entitled Against the Wind. Now, it's not Bob Seger's <laughs> song Against the Wind, but this is Dallas Holmes' song Against the Wind. And the, the song starts out, problems on the rise, troubles just increase, responsibilities never cease. Fears and doubts assail, worries from within, Sometimes life can just be like walking against the wind. Against the wind, against the wind. Sometimes life is just like walking against the wind. When the storms around me blow, Jesus, please don't let me go. Take my hand and lead me on against the wind. There is a challenge in the struggle of a storm. And the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 6, and it says that Jesus actually sees the disciples. Now, I don't know how that happened. I don't know if it was a, a, a vision, a bit, ability to see. We don't know if it was a moonlit night. But the scriptures tells us that Jesus sees the disciples struggling painfully, Mark says, against the wind. Jesus sees us in our struggles. And John tells us that they actually had rowed for six or seven hours. This is the third watch of the night. And made three or four miles. These are professional fishermen. So you know that the storm, wind storm, had to be very, very strong and caused them a great deal of trial and effort 
and energy. Now, the word here used in Matthew is, is, a, is a word of opposition. Now, Jack Hayford, who I trust, said that he did a word study on this particular Greek word, and there were four uses of this word that we find in Matthew 14, 24 to talk about this struggle against the wind. Four uses of the word in, in New Testament times that talk about opposition and the struggle and maybe a little bit of torture, distress. And one of them, he says, is a legal struggle. And as you know, uh, this virus is taking kind of front and center of everything, but there are other struggles going on in people's lives that are just not about this virus. Have you ever been involved in a legal struggle and it just seems like it goes on and on and on and on and on and there seems to be no resolution to the issue, whether you are the pursuer or the one being pursued. And it can be so taxing and so draining. And like, Lord, when will this ever end? There are health care. And he talked about how this word is used with, with health crises or severe diseases in New Testament times. And how... You know, when we're involved in a health care struggle or a surgery or something that's a major deal, that sometimes that the pressure and the stress and the de-stress that go with the health care struggle just can seem like it goes on and on and on and it zaps our strength and oftentimes it blocks us from our goal. And then the third type of usage in New Testament times had to do with circumstances. And in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 7, you know, uh, the Bible talks about how Lot was in an unfavorable circumstance, that he was vexed, that he was distressed. Another translation says that sometimes it can be so depleting as a Christian that you're trying to live a godly life in an environment of ungodliness, and it can just feel so distressing in your soul. And then the fourth and final uh, usage that uh, Jack Hayford talked about of this particular word was the usage of a demonic attack, the distress that comes with a demonic attack. Now, the, the particular usage talked about a sorcerer sicking, you know, dark spirits onto somebody else, kind of a voodoo type thing. Now, I, I, you know, I don't know what to do with that, but <laughs> I would say that, that, you know, sometimes that we can be oppressed and vexed and pressured by an enemy, and that is a very, very real challenge and struggle. We need to remember, though, that although God sees us in the struggle, we are not outside of his vision and his interest. You know, there's a story, an Old Testament story about Hagar, who is in great distress in Genesis chapter 16, and God comes and meets her in the middle of her distress and after she encounters God she names him the God who sees me and sometimes we need to be reminded in the midst of our struggle that God sees us in the midst of the storm the third and final point that we want to make this morning or touch on this morning is God shows up or Jesus shows up in the last watch of the night. If you'll notice again in, in Matthew chapter 24 at verse 25, and it says, In the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. It's the darkest part of the night. It's between 3 a.m. and 6 p.m. And I would su suggest to you this morning that Jesus shows up in a very unexpected way. How many of the disciples would have, would have guessed? We don't know. But how many would have guessed that Jesus was going to show up walking on the water in the midst of their storm? You know, if we were uh, just kind of guessing, we would guess that they would anticipate meeting him on the other side the next morning. But Jesus shows up in a very unexpected way. And sometimes in the midst of the storm, Jesus shows up in a very unexpected way. And we need to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear where 
he shows up because oftentimes it will be in a way that we least expect him. That we least expect him. I would suggest to you too that Jesus showing up at the last watch of the night provides a great teaching moment for the disciples. A great teaching moment for the disciples. You know, Oswald Chambers talks about how in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the stress, in the midst of pressure, God often wants to, us to unlearn certain things as well as to learn certain things. Sometimes he wants to challenge us with false assumptions that we make or false beliefs about who he is, false beliefs about his character. And the storm provides a great teaching moment for the disciples. You know, if we look at the scripture, the disciples immediately become fearful and terrified. It's a ghost, they cry out in fear, but immediately spoke, Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And maybe we need to hear those words anew and afresh this morning. Take heart. It is I. Don't be afraid. And it's so interesting that, that one word or several words from Jesus can make all the difference in the world. Have you ever been in the midst of the storm and Jesus speaks to you by his word? Nothing outside changes because it, but because it's the Lord of heaven and earth Everything inside your soul is realigned. And I would suggest to you this morning that there are people here that need to hear this word and need to hear the words of Christ, that those words will settle your soul. They might not change your outward circumstances, but they will in fact settle your soul in the midst of the storm. Peter answers Jesus, Lord, if it is you and we talked on Monday that it's really a sen more sense of certainty. Since it is you, command me, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, came to Jesus. Peter was a professional fisherman, and he was totally brought out of his comfort zone. You know, you can imagine those people on the boat out of the 12. There were probably four. We know that there were four professional fishermen. We probably know that we're, there were, uh, you know, there are other types of disciples with different types of personalities. But Peter says, Lord, since it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And a storm is an opportunity for us to step out of our comfort zone. It's the ability to focus on Christ and hear his word and obey him. But because Peter became, Peter got distracted and he started to put his eyes on the storm or the wind, the Bible says, he saw the wind, he began to sink. So he got out of the boat, began to sink. And when he began to sink, he became afraid and he cried out, Lord, save me. He knew who Jesus was. He knew that Jesus had the power to save him and to rescue him. And could I suggest to you that as we bring things to a close this morning, Jesus reaches out his hand takes hold of Peter, saves him, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. And on Monday morning, we talked about how this is the first profession or confession of faith by the disciples, because they saw who Jesus was. That he had the power to create the miracle of the 5,000, that he had the power, that he was the Lord of heaven and earth that even the winds and the storms obeyed him and they see in just a few verses later that Jesus has the power over all disease scripture tells us that Jesus is Lord of all and as we close this morning I would invite you we're going to sing a song 310 he lives and I want us just to focus on the second verse of this particular him this morning 310 it's going to be the words are going to be on your screen in just a moment and all the world around me I see his loving care and though my heart grows weary I never will despair I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast and that and the day of his appearing will come at last he lives he lives 
Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives salvation to impart. Lord, save me. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your presence in the midst of the storm. And we thank you that you, Lord, are Lord of heaven and earth. And Father, we bow before you today. We acknowledge you as Lord. And Father, we pray that as this service draws to a close, that we might hear your voice and our soul might be settled in the midst of the storm that we are in. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Foes may say, I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know. this place we are people of the resurrection our hope is in Jesus Christ so may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit amen sent forth by God's blessing our true faith confessing the people of God from this dwelling take leave. The 
service is ended, all now be extended. The fruits of our worship in all who believe. The seed of the teaching, receptive souls reaching, shall blossom in action for God and for all. God's grace did invite us, and love shall unite us to work for God's kingdom and answer the call.